Okay, here we are, Apache Spark. Uh, this is your fearless leader, Jeffrey Fox, down at the bottom here. Um, we need to just get going. This is the second lecture series on MapReduce. The first was Hadoop, and the second is Spark. Spark is, in many ways, improved on everything Hadoop can do. It's not obvious, it does except. The Hadoop is sort of specialized, slightly specialized, and it doesn't do some of the things Spark does. And so it can be optimized and say things like, I don't know, the erasure coding you use for the latest fault tolerant disk storage. But in general, Spark is sort of a second generation MapReduce, and it has special features like fault tolerance, when it has these things called RDDs. And also machine learning, where it has a support for iterative computations, which are do blanks, lacks. All right, here we are. This is a general introduction to Spark, which, as we noted, is fast, at least fast compared to Hadoop, mainly because it uh, avoids writing to disk in a direct fashion using in memory uh, databases and things like that. And it um, is, supplies basically a cluster computing programming environment. I would say system here, but I'm not certain that's quite the right term. A system is a piece of hardware and software all put together. So it's a programming environment. And it, it provides both a user interface and a runtime. The runtime is the collection of software, libraries, and things that support the execution of a Spark job. Uh, it is, as we will come back to from time to time, it is slower than traditional custom parallel computing solutions. But that's only if you run parallel computing jobs. Most of the time, Spark is not running traditional parallel computing jobs. And then when it is, so in the, this, in the cases where it's really used a lot, Spark is possibly the best available solution. It is open source, which is nice, and as I pointed out, big data software today is largely open source. Spark, like most of the other ones, is Apache. Apache is not the only open source, uh, but it is uh, the largest uh, collection of open source projects there is. And it has a wonderful community model for supporting open source software. As I mentioned, it has Spark has an in-memory uh, database and um, that uh, allows it to support a much richer, faster model where some things are put on disk, some things are put in RAM. That's been put on disk, it acts as a backup for fault tolerance. And it, there are many things that show it running 100 times faster than Hadoop. Um, but that's sort of a little unfair because that's probably running jobs which Hadoop is not very suitable for. The ease of use of Spark is similar to Hadoop because it has the same MapReduce model. And you can use uh, Java, Python are the two most common probably, uh, R, Scalar, but you normally will um, use uh, Java or Python. It has lots of high level operators, libraries and things. And uh, you can use those to, have, to do everything from deep learning, which is not actually very good at, uh, through uh, Running uh, streaming data or running bash jobs of a relative of a, almost any type there are, and um, you can then do orchestration, and um, you can have various features of it. There's SQL interface, which used to be called um, Shark, now called Spark SQL. MLlib is um, the library. Uh, GraphX is the graph library, and Spark Streaming is the use of Spark for streaming. That's all that there is. There's lots of it. It's a really rich environment built actually by this open source community. It was uh, created in 2009. Uh, we created the, com the um, competition Twister earlier than that, but uh, Berkeley had uh, many, many more students and much more money than we did. And um, Zariah was the fellow who student who did that. He was in Michael Franklin's AMP, AMP, AMP lab, and it was meant to improve Hadoop, just as we Twister was improving Hadoop. Um, 
So these are the features which are Hadoop, which it improves. These are not the Spark features, but the Hadoop features. And um, there are lots of original applications, such as Bay Area traffic it was used for. And then it was so successful it became a open source. In 2013 it became Apache. And it's, if you measure by the number of meetups and other types of activities, and um, it is by far, probably the by far the most successful Apache project. It suddenly has many more, uh, seemingly a much richer community activity than Hadoop. Um, here we are around Spark 2 now, from 2016, and Spark 1 came out in 2014. So it is roaring ahead. There are, of course, improvements uh, going on at Berkeley. The Rice Lab at Berkeley is is working on newer versions, and we're working on a newer version here called Twister 2. So, as I say, at its heart, the reason for the speed is that the dupe did everything to disk. Now, although you can criticize that, actually the things it writes to disk at the Hadoop, if you only use it to run the problems it was originally designed for, actually writing the disk is not a problem. It's actually actually a good idea, because it produces a much more robust fault tolerance system. But Spark, people then soon extended Hadoop to do problems which is not quite so suitable for, and that's where Spark steps in. It does uh, the non-totally disk-based applications that uh, you really want to do, but which um, Hadoop was rather slow when you used it. Um, it has, as you mentioned, a over 80 operators. Um, and you do not have to just use Java. You can invoke R libraries and things like that. Uh, we've already just mentioned the in-memory processing. And um, it also is designed, this whole model of, of data transfer is designed to do large messages, which is quite common in big data problems. It involves, it supports a data flow model, which has a graph defining the execution model. That's very common in this um, in this uh, community, or you might say in the distributed computing programming. That the model is at its heart a graph. That's not true in parallel computing. In most parallel computing, the model is not a graph. Although if you do parallel computing for, for graphs, then you will see a graph. Um, also in parallel computing, if you do the higher level um, joining of jobs together, you will see a graph. But Spark has been supporting a graph at a much finer grain size than that, at all levels of the programming environment. Uh, RDD is um, a very critical abstraction. It's the database model that allows you to do backups. And those backups can then be used to restart Spark jobs. Spark streaming is not so great. Um, because it is not nearly as powerful as Storm or Heron or Flink, which are better designed for from the get-go to do streaming. Spark Streaming says, well, streaming is just a collection of small batch jobs. Um, so it can do a, all aspects. It's a pretty rich model, which can do several aspects of the of the um, of the problem, and it can do workflow, which is the Course grain, remember I drew you some pictures of execution models. One is workflow, joining jobs together. The other is data analytics, where you also can do data flow, but it's inside the analytics. And you need to mix everything together, and Spark can do that. Um, Spark also does, can effectively do anything Hadoop can do. And it also uses a lazy evaluation, which means it only calculates something when it's needed. This means that um, that is often a more efficient model, because otherwise you calculate things which end up not being necessary. And I pointed out, there's a huge community. The number of meetups and everything attached to Spark is amazing. This is an illustration of um, what happens at a sort of data flow node, which is this uh, data flow node, when something happens in Spark. Say it's between um, uh, maps here, some maps running, and then they hit a node, which means the maps write to disk in Hadoop. And then they say, here's a reduce, the reduce reads from disk. 
And in Spark, instead of writing the disk, everything is done dynamically with streams and running on the computer uh, without going to disk, and it is much faster than Hadoop. However, if you compare that to classic parallel computing, it actually does this complicated switching between mapping and reduce by not starting any new task. In Spark, you actually start a new, when you do a reduction, you start a new task, which is of course what Hadoop does as well. But if you go use classic parallel computing, you do not start new tasks. Rather, you have long running tasks which run forever, and they exchange messages or do something to synchronize at the end of all maps or the end of all reduces. Uh, that may not seem very important if you do map reduce, but if you do iterative map reduce with a thousand maps and a thousand reductions, the, the parallel computing model is particularly attractive. So, and this is actually, this idea, this point here is what we're building into Twister 2, which is, if you like, our rival to Spark. All right, resilient distributed data set. Bum bum, that's RDD. RDD is a very important feature of Spark. Notice uh, the AMP group is um, actually a database group at its heart. Michael Franklin is well known for his contributions to database. And so they did a particularly good job of RDDs. And it's a cacheable, and then it can be in memory, database technology. And unlike most people who do fault tolerance by just cleaning everything out the disk in some rather difficult to understand format, Spark sends things out to disk in a database format, which is in, seems better to me because databases are defined. To, so that you can actually understand what you write out. Whereas if you just fling out some files in a random format, it's much harder to keep track of everything. So you have me memory objects, and that object is written to disk, is shared between jobs, and it is much faster than uh, disk sharing of our disk. Um, or else it's also much faster than sharing of our networks. And so by having an in-memory database, you gain a lot. Um, and so this improves everything interactive, especially in iterative jobs. And we will go page rank at the end, which is a typical iterative problem. Um, but there are many others. The standard one you use is clustering, k-means, logistic regression. These are all iterative. It's small vector machine. These are all iterative algorithms. Um, and then for interaction, you have a data set and you're querying it. If everything is in memory, you can reuse that memory and get much faster response. Um, and the previous frameworks which required a stable disk system to be written before you can do anything is not necessary here because you have the um, in-memory database lazily writing things out to disks and it does not hold you up. It's actually a, an efficient technology. So we've already mentioned lazy evaluation at the bottom of the previous slide. And um, we've already pointed out what that means. You do the computation when you need it, not when it's defined. You define it, it sits there, when you need it, it gets done. And uh, Spark maintains a list of when it gets done. And that gets done at data flow nodes and things like that. Uh, we have RDDs, RDDs. Keep track of how they were built and what they depend on. And um, they are created again by data flow nodes, where that data flow node might be a map, might be a join of multiple maps and things like that. Um, you can share data across processes, and RDDs are immutable, maybe you write them once, you do not write them many times. So once they're written, they can't be changed. If you need to change them, you have to write a new RDDs. This allows you to safely reuse RDDs and restart in a clean fashion. Partitioning is like Hadoop. You need to take your job, your data, partition it into parts and run one part on each process. And um, that's how we do parallelism, as I pointed out. Big data uses very simple parallelism. And my impression is that the world um, advances. Uh, parallelism might become more complicated in big data, and the simple orders, the, the, 
the feature of parallelism within both a group and spark that is automatic might disappear because it may not be actually practical. Uh, we have persistence because of RDD, and RDDs are typically defined at coarse grain synchronization points such as data flow nodes. So it's got a lot of pretty interesting features, which are going to be present in all these different programming environments. And interestingly, there were not before Spark and Hadoop came along, there weren't really big data programming environments in the same fashion. There was parallel computing runtime, that's MPI. There were workflow engines, which is just to join jobs together. But they weren't all packaged together in a complete system like they are in Hadoop and Spark. And that's pretty important. I think the fact that they're packaged together is a good idea and is uh, important and should be, uh, will be built into future systems. Okay. That's the end of this little sub-lecture. We will go on to the next sub-lecture. Thank you very much.